before we get started, I just want to let everybody know this was not me actually doing my makeup to go somewhere. This was me playing with some black eyeshadow because I ain't got shit to do. Hey guys, okay, so this week's episode was really insane. It's for sure a cross between Fifty Shades and Dirty John. I'm not even going to give you like a, a prequel. We're just going to jump right into the life and crimes of John Edward Robinson. So, in 1963, when John Edward Robinson was only 21 years old, he met the love of his life, Nancy Jo Lynch, and they had a very short whirlwind romance before getting married and moving to Kansas to start their life together. They met and married in Illinois, and then they moved to Kansas in like 1964. Um, they moved there because that's where John's first job was. He was an x-ray tech, but what nobody knew is that he wasn't actually an x-ray tech um, because whenever he went to x-ray technician school, he dropped out and instead he just forged his um, degrees and credentials. Yeah. And uh, somehow he didn't get caught and he actually went through multiple, multiple jobs. In fact, between 64 and 66, I want to say he went through at least three jobs. And the reason being is because he kept getting caught for embezzling money. Yeah, he was a thief. He was a white collar criminal and he was really good at being a con man. So you will soon find out. Now, Nancy is said to have had no knowledge of what kind of person her husband secretly was. So anyway, so during this time period of 1964 and 66, John and Nancy have their first child in 65. His name is John Jr. And by the end of this story, you're going to be like, holy crap. It's got to suck being named after that guy. Okay. But anyway, nonetheless, they have their first child together in 1965. And like I said, between 64 and 65, John is just constantly getting a job, stealing, getting fired, getting a new job, stealing, getting fired until 1966 when he goes to work for Dr. Graham and he worked there for three years until in 1969 when he was caught for stealing again, only this time John had embezzled $33,000 and that's a lot of money to embezzle for an x-ray tech in the 60s, right? This time, though, his employer actually pressed charges against him, and John was arrested at work and walked out in handcuffs. Woo! But his punishment was a three-year probation, which ain't shit. That ain't nothing. Nothing. Of course, because that probation ain't shit, um, it does not stop John from anything. In fact, in 1971, he gets arrested again for nothing other than embezzling. And the only punishment that John gets the second time he's caught embezzling is a probation extension because the first probation worked, right? Then he does it again in 1975 and he gets what? An extension on his probation, which is, come on, do better people. So in the late 70s, John switches things up a bit and he actually presents himself as a really successful entrepreneurial business owner and he cons his way into like kind of a higher society circle of people. Um, he joins a philanthropical group in Kansas City. This group is full of like just well-to-do, well-respected community members. Um, that typically have more money and, you know, are really invested in doing charity work. And John even gets himself a spot on the board of a charity. He cons his way into being named Man of the Year by the Kansas City Mayor. I mean, he gets balls deep in this group of people. And it's insane. So, by all means, in the late 70s, things seem to be looking really good for John. He's found a higher group of people with more money to embezzle and defraud. He was able to move his family into a nine-bedroom manufactured home on four acres. He is like talking the talk and walking the walk of a prominent businessman. His probation ended in 1979, and it's all looking up, right? Until in... 
Then in 1982, John actually got busted for embezzling and writing fraudulent checks and the member of this like, you know, community that he's infiltrated and he gets sentenced to jail finally. He finally goes to jail for all of his theft and fraud, but he only goes for 60 days, which is total BS to me. After John's extremely short stint in jail, he gets out and he immediately asks a buddy of his for $25,000 to invest in a hydroponic company that did not exist. It was just a shell company for him to defraud people into buying stock right? And getting investment returns from. So that's not the only shell company that he starts up. He starts up two more, one called Equi Plus and one called Equi Two. And that is where John's crimes really start to escalate beyond just white collar theft. Um, before I jump into why we're really talking about John, I just want to let you know, everybody says that John was a great father. He really seemed like an innocent, fun-loving business family man. He did. He he was involved in all his kids' activities. He coached all of their all of their sports. Um, very loving, involved father by all accounts. So what I'm going to tell you what he was really like is completely shocking to people. Let's jump in. So it's 1983 and John puts an ad in the paper looking for a sales representative for his hydroponic business, which doesn't even exists. It's not even real, right? And this 19-year-old girl named Paula answers his ad and she's really excited. It seems like the perfect job for her. She talked to this John guy. He's going to send her for on-the-job training and voila. But as soon as she leaves for this supposed on-the-job training, she's never ever heard from again. So her family files a missing person report and the police track down Paula's supposed future boss, John. And he says, yeah, she was supposed to come work for me, but she never did. And that's all I know. And police are just like, huh, okay. You know, it's not illegal for a grown woman to go missing. And then next thing you know, Paula's family receives a typed and signed letter from Paula saying that she was running away to start her life over. Is it possible? Yeah, it's possible. Um, was it probable to Paula's friends and family? No, not really, but the case goes cold. Then in 1984, a girl named Lisa Stacy and her four month old baby go missing. So it's a lot. Lisa was native to Kansas. She was a struggling single mom who'd basically been abandoned by her baby daddy so he could run away and join the Navy and just get away from the whole situation. So she's like living in sh uh, shelters with her kid, you know, really, really struggling. When a man named John Osborne approached her for a program that's designed for struggling single mothers. Now the program provides childcare, on the job training, housing, and even a small allowance but it takes place in Texas. So he would have to take her and baby Tiffany down to Texas where she could basically start a new life. She agrees. She takes the bait. John comes and picks up Lisa and baby Tiffany one day in January of 1984. And that's going to be the last day they're ever seen again. Okay. The same day that John picks Lisa up from her in-laws and takes her to the supposed training place in Texas, Lisa frantically calls her mother-in-law, accusing her of trying to steal her baby. And she says to her mother-in-law, they said you're trying to take my baby and I'm an unfit mom and you, they made me sign all these blank pieces of paper. What's going on? And Lisa's mother-in-law is on the phone with her, like, what the fuck are you talking about? And she's just like, I don't know what's going on, Lisa, but I'm telling you, I'm not a part of it. Like, I'm not trying to steal your baby. And then Lisa's like, oh my God, I gotta get off the phone. They're coming, I gotta go. She hangs up and that's the last time anyone actually speaks, hears from, or talks to her in person ever again. The next morning, Lisa's mother-in-law calls the hotel that Lisa had called her frantically from the night before, and the hotel uh, desk person informs the mother-in-law that Lisa and Tiffany have checked out. When the mother-in-law asked the front desk people who rented the room, she was anticipating them to say John Osborne, 
but they said instead John Robinson. And for some reason, this like really kind of freaked Lisa's mother-in-law out that it was a fake name. And so she decided, okay, we need to go ahead and report this to police. So they go and report this to the police. And not long after, Lisa's mother-in-law receives a letter from Lisa basically saying that she's going to start a brand new life with baby Tiffany. She met this man named Bill and they're not going to hear from her again. But the thing is, Lisa does not know how to type. Okay. And there's no way that she learned how to type that quickly and making no errors. It just, Lisa was like very uneducated, um, a little bit vulnerable, a little bit naive, and they just knew that these were not from her. Nonetheless, police go and talk to this John Robinson guy, and he maintains that, yes, I'm part of this charitable organization. We set Lisa up and everything, but then she decided to run away with somebody else and start a new life. And they thought it was weird because it was eerily, eerily similar to this Paula lady's disappearance. Like, women are the same age, um, they just fall off the face of the earth, typed letters that are signed by them. It's not adding up, but there's nothing really that they can find to prove it's anything beyond a coincidence. And so Lisa's case ultimately goes cold also. Then it is 1987 when a 27 year old woman named Catherine Clampett from Texas relocates to Kansas for a new job. She's going to be working as an assistant for a CEO of a big company in Kansas. And right after she locates to relocate, sorry, to start this new job, she disappears off the face of the earth too. Then Catherine's family receives a letter saying that she's starting a new life. It's typed, it is signed, and they decide to file a missing person report. Now, I don't know how, but Catherine's case was not initially connected to the other missing women and connected to John Robinson, right? Um, but what I do know is that around the time that Lisa went missing, police really, when I say that they had a feeling, they really had a feeling that John was a part of it, but they couldn't find anything besides um, coincidences, blah, blah, blah coincidences to link him to these crimes. So they ultimately decided if we can't get him for kidnapping women, I think we could probably find out that he's been doing some more fraudulent stuff. And that's exactly what they did. Although they couldn't make a connection between him and those two missing women, they did go through his finance records and his business practices and find out that he was in fact running more white collar crime schemes. So they end up revoking his probation and he has to go to prison for six years. Thank God it's about time. So he goes to prison from 1986 to 1993. Whew. After being released, seven years pass by before anybody is connected to John Robinson. But what happened was a woman named Suzette Turner had met this John man online and she was going to go start a new job and a new life with him. Um, you see, she actually met John on a BDSM chat group. John was a dominant partner looking for a sub partner that could be kind of like a submissive sex slave for him, right? And Susan, not only was she into the subdom lifestyle, she was also a nurse. And John made up this crazy story that he was a prominent businessman that had a really sick father with like really declining health. And he wanted to find a full-time nurse that could travel the world with him and his father. And Suzette was perfect for this role because she could be his dad's nurse and she could be John's sex slave, right? Suzette was really excited to be, you know, moving away with a prominent businessman. And she took the bait and she packed her bags and she went to Kansas where she, of course, was never heard of ever again. Now, I will say Suzette's mom was harder pressed about this whole situation because she knew even though she got these typed letters that were signed by Suzette and she got these emails, there was no way that if Suzette 
had decided to not take this job and run away with some man to sail the world, which is what John wrote to Suzette's mom, pretending to be her, that Suzette damn sure wouldn't just write her mom and then never speak to her again. They had a very, very close relationship their entire lives. Something was wrong. Decides to file a missing persons report and she contacts the Kansas City Police. Now, they're very familiar with John Robinson because they remembered all the fraudulent charges he had in the 1980s, 1970s. And then they also remembered that they really thought he was connected to those missing women's cases, but they could never prove it. And now here there is another woman who's connected to him because she was going to take a job working for this prominent businessman that John always pretended to be. Now, police take a like bit of a more serious stance on this case and they decide, you know what, we, there, there's no way, there's no way that all this is a coincidence. So they start running surveillance on John and what they find out is really kind of shocking. Um, I just want to pause and let you know that at this point, FBI profilers, police that have been looking into John. A lot of people thought like, man, this guy's kind of sus. He's up to something. But they also admit that, yeah, we thought he might be up to something, but he genuinely did seem like a good, honest family man and just a white collar criminal. We were not anticipating how twisted and devious and sneaky this guy really was. Police were, police were initially shocked during their surveillance when they discovered that while John's wife was at her nine to five, John was all over the seedy part of downtown Kansas City, Kansas, hanging out with prostitutes, meeting strippers in hotel rooms, a lot of shady, shady business activity. That is also when they found out that John was using online BDSM chat rooms to lure Vern to lure vulnerable women to come see him and he would put them up in hotel rooms, pretend that he would give them jobs, whatever he could do. And they were actually coming from different states to meet him. Is that? Yeah. So police are like, what the heck? Between the hours of nine to five, John is a dominant sex crazed maniac, right? But it still doesn't quite prove that he's murdering women. Then two women come to the police station two days apart from each other and they actually file sexual battery charges against John. See, apparently he'd lured them from out of state with the arrangements for them to engage in some like BDSM sex but he was being extremely aggressive and going outside of kind of the parameters of what the women were comfortable with. So they actually pressed charges against him. Okay, and with that, police decide, all right, that's it. We can at least arrest him for the sexual battery charges if everything else falls through. Um, this also was the evidence that they needed to get some search warrants granted for his property and his computer property. And they do. Finally, in 2000, they go and they arrest this guy for the sexual battery assault, his connection to four missing women, and they get to search his stuff finally. John was so surprised, he literally turned pale white and just dropped to the damn floor. But they said it only took him a minute until the initial shock wore off, and then he went back to being his arrogant self, like, oh. You guys don't really have anything on me. What? Haha, <laughs> just a little bit of financial fraud. Okay, so let's just get to the meat of this story. On John's property, they find two barrels next to his shed. And in one of his storage units, they find three barrels. What do you think are in these barrels? Okay, I'll tell you what's in these barrels. In these barrels are human remains. So the police are for sure like, this, this is it. This has got to be the women and baby Tiffany that we've been looking for. So they open up the first barrel and it is in fact Suzette. But then they open up the second barrel and they don't know who's in that barrel. And then they open up the three other barrels and 
They don't know who those people are either because none of the other barrels are people that they were looking for or were missing and in connection to John. We now have three, I'm sorry, four new victims. Okay, so Suzette was in the first barrel on John's property. In the second barrel on John's property was a 19-year-old woman who was lured right before Suzette had been lured in 1999. Only her parents had no idea that she was missing. Um, in fact, they thought she was traveling abroad with her new rich husband because those were the letters and emails that they were getting from her, that she'd been traveling with a rich man. All right. Then the three barrels that were found in John's storage locker belonged to Beverly. Now, Beverly was the prison librarian from when John went to prison, in, right, between 86 and 93. And in 1993, when he got out of prison, Beverly divorced her husband and told everyone that she was going to be traveling. But really, she went to go be with John in Kansas and was never heard of again. And nobody thought anything about it because they got all these letters indicating she was starting a new life. Now, what's really bad is in the other two storage con ten, in the other two storage containers were a mother and a daughter. So we have a mother named Sheila and her 15-year-old daughter named Debbie who had spinal bifida. And Sheila was probably one of the first victims that we know of that John Lord on the BDSM website looking to be in a sub-dom relationship. He had told Sheila that he was a really rich businessman who could get her a job, pay for Debbie's medical expenses, and wanted to be with her. Yes. So the remains of all women showed that they'd been killed by blunt force trauma and had no marks indicating that there was a struggle. So they were likely struck in the head with what looked to be a ballpoint hammer while they were either unconscious or not looking or unaware John was going to strike them. Now, the question is, where is 15-year-old Tiffany? Well, Mrs. Robinson came forward and she actually said she had an inkling that the baby John's brother adopted all those years ago, the same year Tiffany went missing, she had a feeling that that baby was Tiffany. And guess what? She was right. John had pretended to set his brother up with an attorney that was able to find him an infant of a woman who killed herself in a domestic violence shelter. He took his brother's money, pretending it was for the lawyer fees and retainer, and then he literally forged adoption paperwork. He put a fake judge and a lawyer's name on it, and by all accounts, it seemed legit like it, it was actual adoption paperwork but it was just forged by him which is it's insane okay so anyway john gets the death penalty for three of the murders the murders against lisa isabella and suzette however um for some reason, two of the verdicts were overturned, but it doesn't matter because the verdict for Isabella never was, and he was still had the death penalty for that one. So he's on death row in Kansas. He also traveled to Missouri to answer for the rest of the murders and the three missing women whose bodies were never recovered. John would never like say what he did with the bodies, how he killed the women, where the remains are. He basically just admitted that the state had enough evidence to find him guilty, and he got five sentences of life in prison. Nancy actually testified on behalf of her husband and begged the jury to spare his life, saying that they would all, him and his children, be still involved, still talking to him so long as he didn't get sent to death. And she stayed married to him until 2005. So the couple was married for 41 years. Seriously, guys, there's so much more meat to this story. If you go and check out my podcast, Storytime Slayer, it's on Apple, Spotify. Oh my gosh, you can find it on Amazon, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, all of it. I'm everywhere. Go check it out. And don't forget to enter my giveaway on Facebook. I announce the winner on Friday. There will be three winners. And you guys have a great day. Don't kill anybody. Be careful who y'all are chatting with in that BDSM chat room. I mean, this is two stories in less than a month that, ooh, let's, ooh, let's define our boundaries, people. Okay.
Have a great day. Bye.